We often seem to be surprised when we get a minority parliament after a national election, but the fact is, nearly a third of all our federal elections end in a hung parliament. The last time Canadians declined to give any party a majority was 11 years ago. That's a long time in politics, so we thought we'd enlist the help of several observers with first-hand experience at this to explain how it's all going to work when the 43rd Parliament convenes next month. And with that, we welcome Peter McKay, the last ever leader of the PC Party of Canada. He's a former Conservative Cabinet Minister, now a lawyer with Baker McKenzie. In Calgary, Alberta, Martha Hall Finley, who served in the last minority parliament as the Liberal MP from Willowdale. Peggy Nash, former NDP MP, who served in a minority parliament from 2006 to 08. She now teaches at Ryerson University. And to lend his nonpartisan expertise, there's Peter Lowen, political science professor at the U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And it is a delight to welcome everybody here on this set. And Martha Hall Finley in Western Canada, happy to have you on the line again from Calgary. Let me refresh everybody's memory here. Not that you need it, but maybe our viewers do. Sheldon, the graphic, please, if you would. This is what happened a month ago. Liberals with 157 seats, Conservatives 121, the Bloc coming in with 32. The NDP is now the fourth place party at 24. Three Greens and one Independent. And you all know who that was, Jody Wilson-Raybould. So the Liberals have 157 seats, and if you add up all the opposition, that's 181. So obviously, the Liberals are going to need some help in order to get their agenda through the House of Commons. Peter McKay, start us off. In the last minority parliament, 2008 to 2011, you were the Minister of Defense. How did your job differ under those circumstances as compared to when you were in Stephen Harper's government and you had a majority? Well, firstly, you spend a lot more time in the capital uh, because in a minority parliament, um, snap votes and, of course, even the, the scheduled votes, uh, particularly those that are deemed confidence or those that are budget votes, could and may result in the collapse of the government. So that precariousness brings about a greater uh, physical presence being in Ottawa, but it also has an impact on the way you interact with the opposition. Peggy was there at that time. There is much more impetus to compromise, to find a way to make Parliament function in a more um, productive way, a more uh, congenial way. Uh, it's a shame that we're, we're sort of in this period, but um, there is so much acrimony in the country, there are so many divisive issues, it may very well be that this is a blessing in disguise for everyone, that we can expect that this parliament is going to have to be accountable, and by that I mean accountable to each other. Um, I think the Prime Minister set the tone right, to give him credit, by sitting down with all the opposition members, including premiers, uh, many of whom are Conservatives, and said, what would you like to see in the speech from the throne? What are the issues that you think we need to address first in Parliament? And I'm just going to deposit one right here. I think Martha will agree. This CN rail strike has the opportunity and perhaps the, the, the uh, importance that it may overtake the Prime Minister's early plans in the days of Parliament, because that issue is so important to the West, to the ag sector, to the energy sector it could override all of the other uh, agenda items as we go back to Parliament in a few days. Okay, Martha Hall Finley, let, let, let me take you out of today for a second and still send you back more than a decade when you sat in the House of Commons. How, how did things work in a minority parliament? I know you never sat in a majority parliament, so you can't quite compare, but, but how did it work? Um, I would agree with Peter that I think a minority government forces a greater level of interaction among the uh, people in different parties, which I think is actually very, very good. We've had two majority governments in the last uh, while uh, of different stripes, but both majorities. And in Canada, a majority government is extremely powerful. There really aren't very many checks and balances. And um, as such, I think that the, the environment can be different. It can be frustrating. Um, a minority does actually force people to work together. I mean, I remember uh, establishing great relationships, some great friendships. It's still great to, to be albeit not in the same studio with Peggy, but, um, you know, y you're forced to actually find places where you can compromise. And I think it's also worth remembering that in the, in the Canadian history, minority governments have, have actually accomplished some really terrific things. I mean, I'm sure Peggy would, would talk about health care, Canada Pension Plan. Some really important things have been accomplished in minority governments. There's no reason why that can't be the case in, in this one. Peggy Nash, uh, I think when you were in minority parliament, your party, the NDP, held the balance of power. Mm -hmm. What is the 
What's, what's the mission when you're sort of the ones who decide whether you're going to prop up the government or pull the plug on them? Well, what you want to do is try to make gains so that you can achieve things that matter to people. I think that's what people are hoping with this minority government. Um, if I'm correct, and, and Peter will know this, I think it's the eighth time we've had a minority government. And um, you mean ever since Confederation? Since Confederation, well, it's more than that, I, I think. believe. I think, it's, I think it's probably 14, because it's about a, it's almost a third. Hmm. I think it's 14 out of 43. Is it? Yeah. Um, but we have, as Martha said, made great gains during minority governments. And if you, if you think that um, because of our first-past-the-post system, often governments um, are elected with less than a majority. So often they get less than even 40 percent. So that means the majority of Canadians voted for someone else. And yet, once you have a majority government, the, the, the governing party has all of the power, uh, most of the power. I mean, they really, they can pass their budgets, they can pass legislation, they can shut down committees if they want. Whereas in a minority, you have to have w what I think is productive dialogue and discussion. And you see that, you see that in the House, you see that especially in committees where uh, the opposition has a majority of the votes. And so if the government wants to get its agenda through, it needs to build relationships and have dialogue with the other parties. Let me build on that with Peter Lewin. From your nonpartisan look at things, what kind of characteristics do members of parliament, and let's remember, there are going to be 91 mm -hmm. new MPs in this mm -hmm. house, 91 out of 338. Mm -hmm. What kind of characteristics do they have to have to make this work? Well, they have to be present, so you've got to, you've got to show up, which was, which was Peter's point. And I mean, really, they have to be around, and they've got to, I think, build up good personal relationships with other MPs. I think minority parliaments are a little bit of the revenge of the nerds, you know, <laughs> that, 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 that MPs and critics, cabinet ministers and critics who are going to know their files well and know their legislation well are going to know where the difficult points are and are going to know what things they've got to smooth over um, with MPs. So it's, it's one of these scenarios where details really matter. When you're in a majority parliament, you're, just, you're pushing through legislation, and it's, it's hard to constrain. Uh, the government. But in this case, you know, you'll have to some features of bills that may really tick off some parties. So the people who know the bills really well, understand how they're going to play in, in every party, are the ones who are going to have a better time getting legislation through. And I would just say that, you know, that last government had a very, very strong minor a majority, and they didn't get everything through. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at what they did on small business taxes compared to what they wanted to do, it's a great example of how Parliament really chipped away at a key piece of their legislative um, agenda, electoral reform. They didn't really want to get it done, right? But they couldn't legislatively stick handle that. So when you get into minority parliament, it's just several scores, several orders of magnitude more difficult. So the ministers who know their files well will do well, but the MPs who know the files well can follow the legislation and can really, I think, um, um, find those pain points for the government are the ones who are going to get what they want out of that legislation. Peter McKay, your good friend Bill Davis used to say when he was Premier of Ontario and running minority parliaments between 1975 and 1981, long time, six straight years, He'd say the biggest difference was I had to think politics before I thought policy because I had to I had to know what I could get through, given the you know given the membership of the house at that time, and one of the things that was always on his mind was I wonder if they're going to pull the plug on us today. When you were sitting in minority governments, did you go to work every day wondering I wonder if this is going to be the day they pull the plug on me? Not really, no? um, but it was there. It was an omnipresent feeling around Parliament. Uh, Bill Davis was a, a master personality at uh, working all sides of the House, and, uh, and he had a very skilled cabinet around him too, and I'm sure we're going to have a moment to discuss that. But what I would say about minority parliaments is, uh, you know, it's the classic sausage factory. You don't see a lot of what's going on behind the scenes. The Board of Internal Economy, which I sat on for years when I was in opposition, is where a lot of the internal decision making about legislative agendas, how the, the House itself is going to function. This is a, a committee chaired by the Speaker of the House of Commons. It's really inside, inside baseball. The other thing that I remember very much about minority parliaments was, and Peter's alluded to this, the, the individual relationships that you forge with your critic. Uh, travel, for example, if a committee is traveling, they, they had sort of this informal arrangement, sometimes more formal, called pairing, where if a cabinet minister was going to be outside the country, they would take the critic or, or a certain number of member, members of parliament with them to ensure that the house wouldn't collapse in their absence if the numbers were that close. Does that still happen? It does still happen, but I think not as in pronounced a way. And Peggy's point about 
committees being really the engine of Parliament. That's where the real work goes. That's where the real examination of legislation takes place. Uh, there could be a very interesting scenario, and you referred to Jody Wilson-Raybould's presence as the independent in the House. What if they put her as chair of the Justice Committee? Just Ooh, think about my. the ramifications of that for a moment, mm. if they were to revisit the SNC-Lavalin affair. And the final thing I'll say is let's not forget the Senate, because the mm -hmm. Senate has been sort of in, in, without sitting in Parliament currently or sitting in, in the Senate, they're flexing their muscle. They're, they're saying, all right, Mr. Trudeau, you've unleashed us, called us to independence. Now we're going to form our own independent blocks. And they are. And that's what's happening. So there's a very interesting dynamic shaping up because, let's not forget, yes, you have to move legislation and your government agenda through the House of Commons, so too the Senate. Mm. And you'll recall in the days of Mr. Mulroney with the GST senators, so-called, where there were big muscle movements happening in the House of Commons, they needed that Senate to get those bills into, you know, into being. Mm -hmm. uh, Martha Hall Finley, apropos of the question I just asked Peter McKay, how often in a minority parliament did you, behind closed doors, as a member of the Liberal caucus, how much time did you spend thinking, I wonder if today's the day we pull them down? It's a great question, Steve, and my answer would be the exact mirror of Peter's. Um, not all the time. Um, and, and I think it's important. I keep hearing sometimes people say that, well, we're in opposition, our job is to oppose. I take great exception to that. I feel that anyone who's elected to the House of Commons has a job to help govern the country. Their job is not to oppose things. Their job is to actually help get things done. And, and I think that's something that's worth remembering for, for all of the people in the, in the current government. And that, that goes not just for the opposition, but also government. There were always, of course, times, you, you would remember, Steve, the famous, uh, the famous prorogation um, uh, as a result of, of, uh, of the opposition parties getting together at one particular time. Um, my view is, that, and this is where people have the different discussions about a coalition government versus an issue by issue uh, approach to voting. I think the latter is really, really important because there are a number of issues that are either relatively nonpartisan. I can think of infrastructure. I can think of a number of issues like that. There are a number of issues that become a little more partisan, and then there are some issues that actually take rather interesting partisan directions. So, for example, people are talking all the time now about, you know, who is who? Who are Justin Trudeau going to be aligning with to get support? Is it going to be Jagmeet Singh? Is it going to be, you know, uh, Monsieur Blanchet? But there are some issues. So, for example, um, the Trans Mountain expansion uh, pipeline. If if that it shouldn't come back to the House. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be an issue. It's, just, it, it's gone through all the motions now. But just in case, well, the support would come from the Conservatives, mm -hmm. which is an example of an issue that isn't necessarily something that a coalition government would solve, but a minority government where different interests are actually at work trying to effectively govern can accomplish a great deal. Peter McKay, just a quick follow on that. Can you imagine a scenario whereby if that came back to the House that the Liberals and Conservatives would be on the same side and vote together on that issue? Absolutely they would. Really? There's no question in my mind and I think there's, there's also an interesting dynamic just in the composition of those two parties, the Liberals and the Conservatives. As you know, Mr. Trudeau will have uh, a challenge on his hands with no representation from Saskatchewan, Alberta. Virtually the West, they, they were shut out. Uh, Andrew Scheer, on the other hand, has a, a riches of members of parliament from Western Canada. And they, of course, first and foremost, are daily inundated with concerns around the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and pipelines generally. And so they become natural allies, uncomfortable bedfellows, to be sure. But on that particular issue, there is a coalition, uh, a coalescence of interest, political and otherwise, in making that project move forward. Okay. But it won't be in a bill. No, it'll be in some different kind of a fashion. Correct. Right. Uh, Peggy Nash, again, take us back more than a decade ago. The conversations that happen when you hold the balance of power, I presume there are like fiery debates behind closed doors as to, you know, how, how close to the line do we have to go before we have to pull the plug on these guys? That kind of thing. Because I think people, I was in Ottawa yesterday, and there's a lot of talk about how long is this thing going to last. So how do those conversations go? Well, it's not only in the hands of the opposition, first of all, because the question may well be, when do the Liberals want to go? They'll want to go as soon as they think they can get a majority government. 
-hmm. So it's also in their hands, and it's not easy, but it's certainly possible to force your government down if you think you're in the best position to go to the polls and get a majority government. You, you can orchestrate your own defeat. You can if you know you have something that yeah. none of the opposition parties are going mm. to accept. You could do it in a budget bill or some other confidence bill uh, that would defeat the government. But otherwise, I mean, I don't think the government wants to do that now. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they'll be looking for dance partners, as it were. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it may well be the Conservatives or maybe even the Bloc, and sometimes it'll be the NDP and uh, maybe the Greens. So um, it depends what they want to do. If they, w we hope that they're going to move on something like pharmacare. Um, as Martha had indicated, uh, some of the best legislation and, and the most um, enduring programs we enjoy in Canada, like CPP, like Medicare. The flag. The flag. Came These from minority have come parliament. from minority parliament. So I think we have the ability to do something creative, bigger, important, and enduring. And I would, I would make the case that in a minority parliament, because you have to engage other parties, you have the possibility of getting broader public support. So you're not just you're not just hoping for your base to support what you're doing, but you really are, if, you, if you're having those negotiations with other parties, you have the possibility to, uh, to enlarge the base of support for your legislative mm. initiatives. Can so you, that, could, that could make a difference to what endures mm. from this government. Peter Lewin, can you sort of play that forward a little bit? That The most obvious partnership out there at the moment is the Liberal government supported by the NDP. But what other permutations can you imagine in there that could also work? Well, you have, to, you have to look at the pivotality, right? So in this case, the Greens don't hold enough seats to matter. In the only sense three. That only three. So, so, so they don't matter. So the Liberals only ever need one of the Conservatives, the NDP, or the Bloc. And that's normally been the way in our minority parliaments. I can't recall one when a party's, when the governing party has needed two parties at once, mm -hmm. which means that you can play, you can play off each other. The, the curious thing for me right now is what's happening with the leadership of the, of the, of the parties. Oh, you want to get to that well, now, right? Well, no. It, it, <laughs> I was going to get to that, it, but okay, no, we can go here. It matters in the following sense that, that uh, uh, I'm sorry to, to, to speed up the conversation, but, <laughs> but when Mr. Harper uh, wins his minority in 2006, he's staring down uh, a liberal party that is weakened, and it's going to have a new leader. It's going to go through that process. So he knows that on vote over vote, he can force them to support his legislation as long as it doesn't go too far, because they're not going to start an election in the middle of a leadership campaign. Mm -hmm. um, same thing in 2008. The Liberals were going through some turmoil, as you know. We're in a curious position now where, I mean, I, mean, I think Mr. the judgment of Mr. Shear's leadership will be made in April. Uh, Jagmeet Singh lost a quarter of his votes and half his seats and gave a victory speech on election night. So it's a curious <laughs> thing. I don't know if Peggy can tell us what's going on in her party as to how long he's going to last there. But I think we'll have a better sense of how effective both of those leaders are in opposition eight months from now, a year from now. And if it's the case that they're really not very effective in opposition, it makes the prime minister much, much more powerful because mm -hmm. he knows that he can, he can hold an election over these folks. And, and then if they really get into a formal leadership process, then, then the prime minister's in the catbird seat for as long as he wants to be. Well, since you raised it, let's get into this right now. And I think it's fair to say that of all the party leaders in parliament right now, the one, who is, the one whose position seems to be the most tenuous is uh, Andrew Shears leading the Conservatives. Which is Did remarkable. You? But Which is, considering he's the, yeah. he's the one guy who, who did so much better, actually, last time. Yeah, he got more votes than anybody. He did. He got the most <laughs> votes. <laughs> and that, yeah. It is this issue of perception over reality. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody described Jagmeet Singh's position as uh, he thinks he has a royal flush, but he's got a pair of twos. <laughs> and I think that that reality will sink in when Parliament begins. Did you watch the Leaf game last night by any chance? I did. I mean, th did you watch it right to the end? <laughs> yes. Do you know where I'm going with this? No. Okay. Right you at the going a lot of places with the Leafs these days. <laughs> because they played row. they played in Vegas mm -hmm. and and therefore the game didn't end until something like 12:30 or 1 in the morning. And uh, they got an empty net goal Vegas to win the game. The guy had a breakaway on an empty net, Peter, and he put it in. <laughs> That's does important. This, does this does this line resonate at all with you? Well, it's a very Canadian line. <laughs> uh, when you have an open net, you got to bury the puck, especially when the game's on the line. Uh, so uh, yes, everybody is going to be under the spotlight in this coming parliament. But to come back to this issue of who triggers the election, you'll recall our history in Canadian politics is rife with leaders who made the right calculation and those who didn't. Mr. Kretchen was very shrewd. When Stockwell Day goaded him into an election, it worked out very well for him. 
Joe Clark, not so much. And so the public are, are very uh, skeptical when they see people playing politics at that level on big issues, mm -hmm. on triggering an election for mm -hmm. pure partisan purposes. And so all of them will be kept in check by that reality, I would suggest, and the ever-present polling that goes on. But performance matters. And, you know, to, to use your, your hockey analogy, when people get on the ice, that's when it really matters. You, you can talk a good game, you can have your, your chalk talk or your board uh, diagrams of what you're going to do, but the moment that it all crystallizes is when you're in Parliament, when you're now forced to deliver, to Peggy's point about governments have to really try to live up to their mandate. And uh, I think what we've seen many times is governments laying out a very ambitious mandate. Uh, you know, in 2015, it was going to be live within our means, get back to balanced budget, electoral reform, which was what a lot of young people came out to vote for. Legalizing marijuana, what well, we got there remains to be seen whether that was an important priority. Free trade agreement, still not ratified. So there are still a lot of things to deliver from the last mandate for this government, I would suggest, and there are events that overtake, like the CN strike. As they say, events, dear boy, events. Let's just, before I get Martha Hall Finley to comment on that, um, Sheldon, can we bring up the graphic at the top of page four here? There's just some, some of the recent history with minority governments. Pierre Trudeau, after coming in in a blaze of Trudeau mania in 1968, was knocked down to a minority in 1972. It was only a two-seat margin he had over Robert Stanfield's conservatives, but two years later, he won a majority government back for the Liberals. Uh, quite a different story for Joe Clark in 1979, 40 years ago this year, where he came in with a, major with a minority government, uh, despite actually coming second in the vote tally. Uh, Pierre Trudeau had more votes in that election than did Joe Clark. And nine months later, it was over. He lost it when they went back to the polls in 1980. Uh, Paul Martin came in with a minority in 2004, and he was out in 2006. Stephen Harper came in with a minority in 06, it lasted till 08, and then he got another one from 08 to 11. And yes, confirmed, 14 minority governments in 43 elections, um, and nonstop actually between 2004 and 2011. We seem to be, um, Martha Hall Finley, let me start with you on this one. We, we seem to have been, over the last couple of decades, more inclined than not uh, to sort of keep our politicians and our prime ministers on a leash. Any idea why? I, I, well, just to follow up on those numbers, I think in this last election, the Conservatives actually got more of the popular vote. They did. Yeah. Um, uh, so so a, a, a continuing trend, if you will. Um, I'm not sure it's a conscious decision to keep leaders uh, in, in, you know, on a leash, as you say. I would suggest that rather it's um, lack of really clear fantastic alternatives. Um, no question Prime Minister Trudeau had to deal with a number of challenges that have uh, arisen over the last number of years, as well as some during the election campaign. And certainly Andrew Scheer had his challenges in particular during the election campaign. So I don't think this election was, we're actively wanting to be moderate, you know, that classic Canadian thing. I think there was a very great sense of, we're just not hugely inspired. And so, you know, I know people who were voting this time saying, I'm really disheartened because, frankly, I'm voting for the party that I think will do the least harm. That is not uh, a really positive way of looking at the country. So I, I, I don't think that's... I, I, I think a lot of people would prefer to feel as though they really had something to get. I mean... You know, those of us who are old enough to remember, Steve, um, 1968. Remember the power of that. Totally forget who it was in, in the sense of Trudeau and Trudeau mania. There was a sense of where can this country go? How, how much further can we take this country? What's that, you know, the optimism, the... The enthusiasm was palpable. Oh, it was, it was a year fantastic. after Confederation. It was a year after our centennial. So it was yes. heady it times, was as it were. He heady times, and I think Canadians loved it. And I don't. So I don't think. I don't. I think people would actually love that again. They just haven't seen those options. Peter Lewin, do you have, a, 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 as you put your sort of political historian's hat on, and you look back over many elections, any sense about why more often than not lately we seem content not to give one party all the power? 
You know, I mean, I agree with Martha that I, I think mostly it's the it's just the, the the mechanics of the electoral system. You know, we have an electoral system that's basically built for two parties to compete against one another, and we've got three, four, five um, running at a running at a time. Um, so you know, that's uh, that's just that's the way things have broken out. But it's just the case that we've got multiple parties. They've got differentiated power bases. So it just you know, some are racking up big 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 wins in other places, um, in some places, some in others. And just the way it tends to break out is that those. Uh, one of those parties wins uh, wins a plurality seats, but not a majority. You know, we only get a majority really when one of the parties has quite a quite a you know below below historical norm mm -hmm. performance. You need the NDP to collapse for the Liberals to win um, a majority, or you need the Conservatives to do quite well and the Liberals to do badly for them to win a majority. Hmm. Is there, Peggy, in your experience, is it sort of unambiguously the case that we get better cooperation and better policy and better outcomes in minority parliaments versus when one party has all the power? Well, you know, coming from one of the non-governing parties, mm -hmm. I would argue yes, because we end up having a greater role to play. Uh, I was thinking about the list of uh, elections that you just showed on the screen. I ran in five elections over a period of 11 years, and one of those was a four-year majority government. Huh. So I, I... They were back at it a lot, weren't they? They were back at yeah. it a lot. It was just non-stop campaigning. But um, we had the same thing in the six. We had 62, 63, 65, 68 yeah. elections in every one of those years, too. Well, you know, Martha makes an interesting point about um, being able to pull the nation together with some kind of aspirational goal. And we have a very fractured nation right now. Um, it is a federation, which by its nature makes us more. Um, uh, more diverse, and, and that is a good thing, but there seems to be a lack of one national project that would bring everyone together. And I'm not saying national unity is the number one issue. Westerners might disagree, but I think there is a generational issue right now where for a lot of young people, they're not seeing government make those big changes that, that they can really get behind. I think they thought 2015 was going to provide that. I'm not sure we got there, but I think there's still... A, one of my kids says, you know, every time um, I, seem, I seem to pay more and more and get less and less, and where is government for me? And I, I think part of that, you know, I want to say, yes, but we have Medicare, we have a good public education system. But I think there is that lacking national project for us to get behind. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we, we need to go to war or something like that. That would be the antithesis of it. I'd like to see something constructive that as a nation well, we can pull together. Well, you think climate change would be that mission, wouldn't it? And there, there is the perfect example. And, you know, I, I, Peter, who I have a lot of respect for, I'd, I'd love to see him influence his party to get them on the page so that we can work together around climate change. It's difficult when we're such a big energy producing nation, but we've got to get there. And can I, I think that, that could be the one that... that you, you see know, that role for yourself right so, now? It may surprise people, but I'm sitting here nodding next to <laughs> Peggy on a lot of these important issues, as I have with other commentators. And uh, Martha touched on it, and Peggy did, about having a, a national purpose, something that does actually unify some of the fracturous nature of our country, regional uh, parties. We have, a, you know, we have a separatist party now back in Parliament in numbers with the bloc. There's a lot of tension fulminating in the West that Martha can speak to in, in more detail. But the issue of climate change, it's real. I, I spent a lot of time as a young man working in the Arctic and then went back as defense minister when we were doing Arctic maneuvers there with the Canadian forces. You can see the change and people who have tracked it, the scientists most importantly, but more important than that are the people who live there and, and see what's going on in their environment. Uh, and so Canada can and should play a leading role. How do we get there is the question. Mm -hmm. Andrew Scheer zeroed in on two things, but didn't perhaps give as much detail as was necessary for people to buy into it. Having a technology response as opposed to a tax response, because Peggy and I may disagree on this, but when young people are saying, look, I'm not getting as much in return because I'm paying a lot of money, and that's true for everybody. We are a very high taxed, very highly regulated environment in this country today, which is hard for businesses, especially startups. And, and there are some brilliant startups in the area of green technology. But the transition period, even the United Nations talks mm -hmm. about a transition period, and it's been coal, 
fossil fuels, oil and gas, natural gas, and then to renewables. So it's a, a, a period of time now where we're working towards getting to fewer emissions, zero emissions, Paris Climate Accord. But I would supplant right here that with oil and gas in, in, in Western provinces that can go to both coasts, that can be exported to the world, that also has a geopolitical implication because we're pushing back on Iran, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, countries we criticize for their human rights, but we buy their product in large amounts, especially in the East. Whereas we have the ability to export a highly regulated, valuable commodity to the world, generate massive wealth, jobs, opportunity in Canada, and plow those resources back into the new green economy. Because we can't pay for it and keep pace otherwise. That's a big project. That's a big national purpose. Let me put that to Martha Hall Finley. Is that a, is that a, I mean, you were on this program a couple of weeks ago talking about the angst that Western Canada is suffering from right now when we talked about Wexit and how strong that is. Do you think the, the vision that was just described by Peter McKay is something that, you know, given who's in this minority parliament, there are Greens who under no circumstances are going to be for pipelines. There's an NDP leader who represents a British Columbia riding who under no circumstances is going to be for that pipeline. Can, they, can this parliament get around that vision? I am so glad to hear Peter say everything he said, and I actually completely agree with him, even though we come from different political backgrounds. The biggest uh, frustration in the, in the election was that the Conservative Party came across as, as, as not having anything really to say on climate change. Yes, there was some talk about technology, but listen, a, a carbon tax on its own is not a climate plan. Saying no to a carbon tax is also no answer. There are so many things going on, and frankly, Stephen, I, I think there's a real opportunity for the Prime Minister. And I would say, just to, to Peggy's comments, national unity is in fact the Prime Minister's first priority. Um, his, his first priority is the national interest and therefore national unity. And it is very bad in the West. Um, recent acti activity on the part of the government, C69, C48, new legislation, are actually perceived in the West now as NEP2. That goes back a generation or more mm -hmm. in terms of just how bad this is. And I will say it took the government of the day five years to actually disband the NEP because they realized just how, how difficult it was. We'll see what happens with this government. The, ch the thing is, we can do both. We, 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 in 2015, even the Prime Minister talked a lot about the and conversation, right? We can do environmental sustainability, climate change, and economic prosperity. The frustration is that over the last few years, and this and this past government, the, the message has been very strongly, mm, we're kind of really focused on the environment piece, and we're really, you know, a lot of people feel as though we're actually cutting the economic prosperity piece off at the knees. Yeah. We can go back to that and conversation. And so unlike during the campaign, when even the prime minister was talking about fighting the oil industry, there is a huge opportunity for him to kill two birds with one stone. National unity and the environment. If, In his view, the oil and gas industry in Canada is seen as a big part of the problem. And just look at greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we're there. As such, they are also a huge part of the solution. So if that, and, and Peter knows the amount of technology, the innovations that are happening, unbelievable things, even just over the last number of years that are, that are a huge improvements and going forward some really extraordinary things. The opportunity for the Prime Minister is to say, um, I want an environmental legacy. So let's look at the low hanging fruit that is in fact the Canadian oil and gas industry. Let's collaborate with that industry so that we can ensure that they are world leading and that we are as Canadians proud of that so that we can actually be, Canada can be the preferred supplier of those energy sources. In so doing and in a, and revising some of the NEP2 style legislation, um, it would be extraordinary. He, he could actually address really deep alienation frustrations in the West, and he could actually do some really terrific things on the environment. Quick follow, Peter McKay. The clock is running because we've seen Encana, we've seen Husky, we've seen some of the, the, the companies, both big Canadian companies and, and uh, foreign investors leave. And so there is a critical mass within the oil and gas sector that we have to embrace and work with, as Martha has said. I, I find myself in lockstep. Uh, including this idea of nation building, and that would bring in Atlantic Canada, where I'm from, where we have a refinery. And what are we refining there, Steve? Mm -hmm. We're refining 
product from Saudi Arabia, from Venezuela, from places where, again, we, we are not working towards any sort of global climate change um, solution. We're, we're simply propping up dictatorships and, and funding their very dirty oil and gas production. And unethical so there's oil, as someone called unethical it. Unethical oil. So there's a massive opportunity mm -hmm. here. But it can't be lip service, and people in the West are apoplectic unless this happens quickly. Political yes. scientist, I got a minute left here. Let me ask you this. Given Andrew Scheer's situation right now, where the Conservatives are in some ways going to be looking a lot inward over the next few months as he works towards his leadership review in April, are the, reader, leader, uh, are the real leaders of the opposition in this country right now the premiers of Alberta and Ontario? I mean, uh, well, those are two different very people. And maybe two Saskatchewan, two, too. Two, two very different people. I think Doug mm -hmm. Ford's trying to find a way to be a constructive national leader. I don't get that impression about, about Premier Kenny, to be, to be, to be frank. Um, no, I mean, if I were Mr. I mean, here's a piece of advice you rarely give. If I were Mr. Scheer, I'd be looking to, uh, to Michael Ignatieff in, in 2008, uh, just before, uh, uh, just after he won the leadership, to see how he negotiated with the Conservative Party to get some things he wanted on the budget. He was effective in that. It won him some plaudits. Didn't work in the next election, but he was effective as the as the leader of the official opposition in extracting uh, you know, in extracting pretty good concessions from the from the prime minister. Gotcha. That's our time, everybody. Thanks uh, so much to all for coming in. Martha Hall Finley, the former Liberal MP in Calgary, Alberta. Peter McKay, the former Conservative cabinet minister, now with Baker McKenzie. Peggy Nash, former NDP MP, uh, now uh, teaching at Ryerson University, and Peter Lowen, uh, who teaches himself. Professor of Political Science at the U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Great to have all of you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks so much, Steve. Cheers. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.